Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Uh, as most of you know, since the summer I've been looking into the role of so-called, I want well, to thank the gentleman for yielding, uh, so-called gray market uh, during drug shortages. My investigation is focused on determining where some of the companies obtain drugs in critically short supply and how much they mark up the drugs that they sell to hospitals and other uh, uh, you know, health care facilities. My staff has heard from countless health care providers about the constant unsolicited office offers for drugs on the shortage list, uh, but at prices that are nothing short of price gouging. For example, one company offered to sell a cancer drug for over $990 per vial, more than 80 times the price a hospital normally pays for it. I recognize the incredible predicament that this puts uh, our health care providers in. I do not envy uh, their choices of, of either delaying or denying treatment until drugs become available from a reputable distributor or paying huge markups on the drugs. Uh, Dr. Hubstep, by the way, I really appreciate your passion. I, I feel it. Um, when your hospital no longer has a needed uh, drug available, what steps does your hospital undertake to, ob to obtain a needed drug? And I am very familiar with chemotherapy, and it is done in cycles. So I guess you might have enough to start a cycle, but not enough to finish the cycle. So I guess you don't start it. Is that how that works? That's correct. Did you write? That's correct. Um, and, and basically part of our committee meetings each week is looking at who throughout the institution is due for what and how much that will entail and how much supply is on hand. Our institution does not deal with the gray market. Uh, we have certainly been approached. We would, our policies, we do not deal with them. Um, and I am continually indebted to the wonderful pharmacists at our institution that have spent an amazing amount of time speaking with manufacturers, tr trying to get drug. Um, it has really been an all-out effort. Do you, do you think there are a lot of other um, health care facilities in, say, South Carolina that refuse to deal with the gray market folks? It is hard to say. I could see how the pressures could get to you. It is very easy to say, sure, we don't want to deal with the gray market. But at the end of the day, when you know that there is a patient on the other end, you could see where that temptation could come along. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know of any instances for sure, but, um, but I know that the threat is out there. To all of our witnesses, can you explain to me how it would be potentially harmful for a patient to be given a drug that has changed hands uh, many times? I, I can just say, uh, Mr. Cummings, that, that the uh, amazing thing about the distribution system, it is very regulated and you understand the pedigree of the drug, which is very important. And uh, so the problem is when you have um, some distributor that you don't know at all that basically sends a fax. I hear from practices all the time that they get faxes about drugs, they get emails about drugs, and you don't understand the pedigree of that. Again, I'm not an oncologist, but um, I think the problem is uh, uh, administering that drug, which my, I don't think my wife would be in favor of as an oncology nurse, administering that drug without a set pedigree is very dangerous because you're talking about extremely, extremely po potentially toxic medication. You know, I was just thinking, just going back to you, Dr. Hussman, when you've got, um, you know, when you've got somebody with cancer and they face life or death and the patient knows, you know, people begin to research. Absolutely. And they, I mean, you ever come in, into a situation where somebody says, wait a minute, Doc, uh, we know you don't have the drug, but, you know, we've done some discovery here and learned that XYZ gray market company has it. We don't care what it costs. Right. We will pay. I mean, do you run into those kind of situations? It is getting to that point. And what my concern is, so, you know, 85 percent of the children I take care of are Medicaid funded. Uh, I am a native South Carolinian, but we are, we are a poor state. And um, part of my passion is that these kids have to have treatment no matter what background or circumstances they come from. So what I am afraid is going to set up, you are going to set a hierarchy of treatment. If you have got the money to pay, obtain some drug, travel to Canada, you can get treatment. But the folks who don't have the finances to do that are left behind, and who's that's going to be? It's going to be the kids. Yeah. Dr. Thompson, uh, are your members concerned with the safety of, of uh, such drugs that circulate in the gray market? Yes, sir, they are. And, uh, you know, this has been a phenomenon that they've dealt with for a, a very long time. And, uh, you know, the notion of receiving faxes came up, and, and this does happen when there's a shortage 
our members get contacted with offers to provide these drugs at exorbitant prices. But, you know, it's really not the price issue so much, not that that's not a factor. It's the safety issue. When everybody knows that there's a profound shortage of a drug, they're asking the question, where did these distributors get the product? Is it safe? How was it stored? What's the pedigree? So it raises really real concerns. Um, many pharmacy departments and hospitals will not buy from the secondary market at all. But uh, as others have mentioned, sometimes there's no other option. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.